Hi, my name is Barry Krush, and I'm the author of Impossible, The Case Against Lee Harvey Oswald. In the process of writing my book, I discovered an astonishing fact, that the evidence that proves Lee Harvey Oswald innocent has been present in the National Archives for nearly five decades. The marks that are on these shells and high-resolution photographs that you're going to see here for the first time prove conclusively that while the shells were indeed fired from Oswald's rifle, they weren't fired on November 22, 1963. And this means that these shells were planted. It's an astonishing story, one not told in your history books, and one told through official photographs. Our first piece of evidence was suppressed from public view until 1992. It's a crime scene search form that proves, with other evidence in the case, that there were no less than five shells supposedly found on the floor of the depository in the possession of the Dallas Police Department and the FBI, not the three that were found, according to the official story. Let's zoom in on the document, and I'll show you what I mean. When we zoom in on this document, we see that there were two spent hulls found by the sixth floor window, not the three that were officially reported, but remember that number, two. We zoom in to another area of the document, and we see that these two shells were turned over to Charles Brown of the FBI of Dallas. An official cover memo for the FBI signed by J. Doyle Williams, also of the FBI, reveals that they received these two hulls. And this is an official type memorandum by the FBI, dated November 22, 1963, which reveals the receipt of the hulls. Let's zoom in on the important part of the document. In the zoomed-in section of this photograph, we read that two photographs were also made on November 22, 1963, of two 6.5 ammunition hulls. Now let's take a look at one of these photographs. And there they are, the two empty hulls, as plain as can be on the FBI's desk. Note the initials JDW on the sign on the desk, indicating receipt by J. Doyle Williams, as the earlier memos confirmed. Well, there you have it conclusive proof that two shells were handed over by the Dallas Police Department to the FBI. But wait, weren't there supposed to be three shells that were found? Well, as it turns out, there were, but three additional shells, which, added to these two, makes five, and that's two more than the official story supports. Let's take a look at that evidence now, reported to the Warren Commission. This is testimony given by Carl Day before the Warren Commission. Counselor Bellin says, all right, you've mentioned these three hulls. Did you put any initials on those at all? Any means of identification? And Day responds, at that time, they were placed in an envelope and the envelope marked. The three hulls were not marked at that time. Mr. Sims took possession of them. And then the testimony continues. Bellin asks, how many shells were placed in that envelope? Day responds, three. Bellin asks, well, it says here that it's written on here, Two of the three spent hulls under a window on the sixth floor. Two. Hmm. Day responds, yes, sir. Bellin, did you put all three there? And Day says, three were in there when they were turned over to Detective Sims at that time. The only writing on it was Lieutenant J.C. Day down here at the bottom. And, in fact, Sims himself confirms the receipt of the shells. Bellin asks Sims, in other testimony to the Warren Commission, do you remember from whom you got the envelope? And Sims replies, Lieutenant Day had it. When he goes to a scene, he has envelopes. In other words, Sims also confirms receiving the shells from Day. And this testimony by Day was confirmed by Captain Fritz in an affidavit to the Warren Commission. Here's what Fritz writes, referring to pictures made of the shells found on the floor of the Texas School Book Depository, not the pictures made by Williams. After the pictures were made, Detective R. M. Sims of the Homicide Bureau, who was assisting in the search of the building, brought the three empty hulls to my office. So, here we have a very clear chain of custody established by the Warren Commission evidence. Day to Sims to Fritz. Three hulls. Unfortunately, the earlier evidence we saw shows it's Day to Brown to Williams. Two hulls. Three plus two equals five. Well, if you're asking yourself how the Dallas Police Department and the FBI are going to extricate themselves from the chain of custody quicksand that they put themselves into, the answer is simple. First, they buried the crime scene search form that revealed the passage of the two shells to Brown. Next, 
They refused to call Brown and Williams to testify before the Warren Commission. Finally, they had to explain how two shells became three shells. I detail this entire bizarre story in the first volume of my book, Impossible, the Case Against Lee Harvey Oswald. But rather than lay it all out for you here, all you have to do is take a look at this hopelessly contradictory story told by Carl Day. In the first version of the story, Hulse Q7 and Q48, corresponding to FBI evidence identification numbers, were sent to Washington. These hulls were also identified as Warren Commission Exhibit Numbers CE 544 and 545, respectively. Both of those hulls were signed by Day and not by Brown or Sims, which would have revealed the contradiction we just witnessed. The other hull, Q6, was supposedly given to Captain Fritz, and it was supposedly initialed by George Doty, Day's boss, who also was not called before the Warren Commission to testify that his initials were on the shell. You can see why when you take a look at the second version of the story, created once all the parties concerned realized the first version of the story was logically impossible. The second version of the story tells a different story entirely. In this new and improved version, it's now shells Q6 and Q7 which are sent to Washington, and shell Q48 which is sent to Captain Fritz. In the meantime, there are additional markings on the shells not present before. You might even get the feeling that what's going on here is something of a shell game. You know, after writing my book, I was so intrigued at these machinations that I thought, gee, with all these discrepancies, just what initials actually are on the shells? So I decided to contact Amy DeLong of the National Archives, and she was kind enough to provide high-resolution photographs of the exhibits. What you're about to see here has never been publicly revealed in the last 50 years after Kennedy's assassination. It proves conclusively that Lee Harvey Oswald was framed for murder. Now, when Ms. DeLong of the National Archives told me they were going to take the high-resolution photographs, I also asked them to see if they could see any markings on the shells just in case they didn't appear on the photographs. And I said to them, use a pointer to point to where you see markings on the shells. And in this photograph of CE 543, they are actually pointing to markings on the shell. But if you can't see it very well, let's go ahead and take a look at the next picture, and it'll highlight it for you. And here it is, highlighted on the shell. Q6, the FBI evidence identification number. And that's it, folks. That is the only markings on this shell. Let's go ahead and take a look at the shell from other angles, which will prove the point. From this angle, all we see again is Q6, and I'll highlight it for you again. And there's the highlighted version. Note the absence of any other markings. And here it is again from a different angle. And once again, you can see Q6, which I will highlight for you and there's the Q6 highlighted. And when we turn the shell around we see no markings at all and of course note the absence of the pointer by the folks at the National Archives indicating that they also saw no markings on the shell. And when we turn the shell a quarter turn we find no markings and no pointer. And here's our final quarter turn of the shell. Notice that the very beginning of the queue appears at the bottom of the picture. And notice yet again the absence of the pointer by the photographer at the National Archives, indicating no markings on this side of the shell either. And there you have it, conclusive proof. Not one of the individuals who handled the shell, not Day, not Sims, not Brown, not Williams, nor any of the FBI personnel who also supposedly handled the shell, have their marks on it. Because we haven't seen it yet, let's take a look at FBI identification expert Robert Frazier's testimony before the Warren Commission on this very point. Here's the testimony. Eisenberg, Mr. Frazier, I now hand you a series of three cartridge cases. I ask you whether you are familiar with these cartridge cases. Frazier, yes, I am. I received these cartridge cases on two different occasions. Eisenberg, do these cases have your mark on them? Frazier, Yes, they do. Each is marked with my initials and the inscription for identification purposes. Eisenberg. Mr. Chairman, I would like to introduce these cartridge cases into evidence as Commission Exhibits 543, 
544, and 545. Now you're probably wondering just what does it mean when not one of the individuals whose initials ought to be on this shell are not? Let me list those names again. Day, Sims, Brown, Williams, Doty, and Frazier. Six names, zero initials. So this means that the original shell, which was found on the floor of the depository, most likely had some combination of those initials. But it's not the shell that we see in this photograph. Yet it was fired from Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle. Unfortunately, because these critical marks are missing, we know that this shell was not fired on November 22, 1963. It was fired sometime later. And that means that this shell was planted as evidence, specifically to frame Lee Harvey Oswald. With this startling evidence in hand, we have to ask, are there markings on the other shells, or is this the only one? Let's take a look. Let's move on to our next shell, CE 544. Again, the presence of a pointer tells us that there are markings. Let's go ahead and see what those markings are. The marking that we see highlighted here is not the marking we're supposed to see in two ways. First, it's only an FBI evidence number, not the initials of one of the people in the chain of custody sequence. Second, and just as important, it's actually the wrong evidence number, as you can see when we take a look at our earlier chart. This number is supposed to be Q7, but instead it's Q48. Or is it? Let's take a closer look. Now here's where things get really confusing if they weren't confusing enough already. I'm going to zoom in on the critical area of this quarter turn of shell CE544. I want you to take a close look at what we see here. At first it looks like you see Q48, but if you look even closer you'll also see Q47. It appears as if someone was confused about the appropriate number to give this shell, scratched in one number, and then scratched in a different one. If you can't see the difference, the next two images will show the numbers highlighted. Here's the highlight showing Q48, and here's the highlight showing Q47. Again, let me zoom in on this for you so you can see everything more clearly. When we turn the shell another quarter turn, we not only fail to find the markings we're supposed to see, we find additional evidence that this shell was originally given a different evidence number. Note that someone had previously attached a label to the shell, discovered the mistake, and then scratched it off. Luckily for us, they didn't do a very good job of hiding the evidence. We turn the shell another quarter turn, and again we find no markings. When we turn the shell our final quarter turn, all we can see is our Q48 next to our primary label and the secondary label at the bottom which was scratched out. And that's it. Let's go on to our third and final shell. And here's our third and last shell, CE545. The pointer is pointing to something. Let's highlight it and see what it's pointing to. As you can see, the marking on the shell is once again an FBI identification number, in this case Q7. As you'll recall, this is actually the incorrect number according to the Warren Commission evidence. Q7 is supposed to be the FBI identification number associated with CE544. This error ties in perfectly with the scratched out number that we saw earlier. Apparently, someone got their shell switched and then forgot to scratch the number out on this one. When we turn the shell a quarter turn, we see a marking. I'll highlight it for you. As you can see, it's the Q7 from another angle. We turn the shell a quarter turn, and again we see no markings present. Turn the shell another quarter turn, and yet again, no markings present. When we turn the shell our final quarter turn, at first we might think that there aren't any markings present here either, but it turns out that there are. Let me highlight them for you. Now for the first time, we're going to see markings on the shell related to the chain of custody. Here we see the letters D and A, which are the first two letters of day. Let's go to the next group of markings. Our next group of markings is apparently what we can describe as indecipherable squiggles. 
Let's go ahead and take a look at the markings with red highlight altogether so we'll get a clearer picture of what's going on. And here are the markings on this side of the shell in their totality. The Q7, which we see at the bottom, the letters D and what appears to be an A, somewhere right above the 7, and then, like I said, the squiggly marks, which are to the right. Let's zoom in on the highlighted view. Here's the letters D and what appears to be an A. And here's a zoomed in view of the indecipherable markings. This is a zoomed in view of the shell flipped the other way around. The same thing this time of the other markings. This is a zoomed in view flipped with the highlights. And here's the same thing with the other markings. And that concludes this presentation of evidence from the National Archives. What you've just seen was, shockingly enough, never explored by the FBI, never explored by the Dallas Police Department, never explored by Congress, never explored by the Warren Commission, never explored by any of America's historians. The evidence proving that Lee Harvey Oswald was framed has been sitting under our noses for the last five decades. Throw away your high school history books and spread the word. The assassins of President Kennedy got away with murder, and considering all we have seen regarding the planning of evidence, got away with the government as well.